very good afternoon. I'm Aisha and I will be your host for today's webinar. Kindly note that this webinar will be recorded. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our monthly Actress Cell Therapy Lecture Series. Today's lecture focuses on cell therapy for liver, cell therapy for liver regeneration. Let's welcome Prof. Dan Yok Yang, our distinguished speaker for today's webinar. Thank you, Aisha. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just put up my PowerPoint slides. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, looks okay. fine. Yeah. So uh, thanks again for joining us for this uh, lunch session. Uh, my topic today will cover uh, liver regeneration and the current frontiers uh, for stem cell therapy. Unfortunately, this has been a very difficult area despite the uh, efforts from multiple uh, centers in the last 20 years. So I'll share with you some of the challenges and what are some of the new directions we're heading, uh, you know, efforts to try to regenerate the liver. We have no disclosures for this presentation. So it has been well documented that the liver is one of the few organs in the adult body that has a tremendous uh, regenerative capability. And this has been documented even since the Greek uh, stories, whereby uh, Prometheus, as you see, was punished uh, likely where eagle will come and feed on his liver and the liver will regrow again uh, overnight. So this is well documented. It is the basis upon which uh, we do our living related liver transplant, whereby we can resect out two thirds of the liver and one third of the rest of the liver for regenerate and gain back almost 90% of its weight uh, within two to three weeks. However, it is uh, important to note that the, the growth post resection is more re hyperplasia than true regeneration because you don't quite get back your double duct anatomy, but the liver's mass and the metabolic functions go back to as normal. And in fact, uh, using animal studies, people have pushed the, board, the frontier to go as far down as 90% hepatectomy, whereby you only need about 10% of the liver and you will still be able to regenerate and, and restore health. So if the liver is, has such strong regenerative potential, why do we still see liver diseases? Um, so, in many common diseases, we see massive cell loss, such as an acute liver failure, or in chronic liver disease, the liver cells go into senescence and do not regenerate anymore. And that's when we see the clinical problems of liver injury and liver cirrhosis. Transplant, actually, is, a, is one of the fantastic treatment options whereby the patient can be cured. But the problem is that the liver graft uh, is limited, and there's been a widening gap between patients who are put on a waiting list and getting the liver transplant. So the number of patients who are falling off the transplant waiting list has been increasing exponentially as well. Plus, liver stem cells provide a very a promising tool to help many of these patients. And it provides an endless source of supply of cells. And not only can we use it for uh, cellular therapeutics, for hepatocyte transplantation, for both acute and chronic liver failure, we also hope to put it into bioartificial liver assisted device for liver dialysis, something which we don't have to get today. Um, gene therapy for metabolic diseases, as well as in the pharma and pharmaceutical industry, they need lots of liver cells for toxicology studies, disease modeling, etc. So I'll cover today uh, the putative liver stem cell, which, which is the best stem cell we have for such therapy, uh, the approach to therapy, what are the challenges we are facing now, and where are we heading? So the hepat actually, if you look at the liver, most of the repair process that happens during liver injury is from the hepatocyte. And in fact, it has been shown that the hepatocyte is probably the ultimate facultative stem cell as, as far as the liver is concerned. The hepatocyte, although it is uh, differentiated, has the ability to proliferate when the need arises. It can undergo multiple rounds of mitosis. It can de-differentiate the progenitor-like cells to form hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. And in serial transplantation, uh, back even in the early uh, 21st century, they have shown that the liver hepatocyte can be transplanted more than 127 times uh, without uh, uh, get, getting senescence. So it is a very highly pliant and plastic cells which can respond to liver injury and can also differentiate to perform this highly specialized function. Unfortunately, the liver cell is only a hepatocyte when it is in the liver. To date, despite uh, efforts, many efforts, it has eluded all attempts to expand it in culture. And the moment you take it and put it on a plate, in, even in 3D culture, it starts losing its hepatocyte function. So while we have tried to, uh, clinicians have tried to use hepatocytes from discarded liver grafts, uh, these are highly limited. And if the advance of using marginal liver graft, the number of hepatocytes that can be obtained from liver, patient, uh, from liver donors, they have become extremely limited and therefore making it difficult to be used as a, ther as a therapy. So 
looking at other candidates themselves, uh, so many labs have tried to look at using alternative cells to, uh, to obtain hepatocytes. And obviously, you can do it from going upstream to embryology, looking at cells in the uh, precursors to see whether you can get hepatocytes out of them. People have also tried transdifferentiating cells from the bone marrow as it's the easiest source available. In fact, many cell types have been shown that are capable of transdifferentiating the hepatocyte in the laboratory uh, environment. So, for example, umbilical cord blood, fat cells, amniotic waters, jelly, uh, mesenchymal stem cells. In fact, they're, they're people used to joke that any cell that you can convince, you can coax to produce albumin is theoretically a liver cell. But the truth is really quite far from that. And although many of these cells can produce some hepatocytic functions, they aren't quite uh, similar to the hepatocytes that we want when we put them into patients. Now, using liver injury models, uh, people have also noticed that there are progenitor cells that do appear during liver injury, which attempts to repair the liver. And the idea is that if you can harness these cells, expand them in vitro, uh, you will then be able to inject them into the liver, or uh, injured liver, to try to repair it. So these are some of the candidate stem cells that have been explored in the last 30 years. So I'll first talk about the embryological stem cell candidates. Uh, induced pluripotent cell, I think all of you are familiar with. Uh, one of our collaborators at GIS uh, had a goal with uh, induced pluripotent stem cell. And you can see that they do form very nice hepatocyte clusters. They can have high good liver function. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the differentiation capability a little bit later on. Um, the Japanese group uh, used another alternative method of reprogramming, whereby instead of bringing a fibroblast all the way back into an embryonic stem cell, they literally push the cell by reprogramming across the valley threshold without becoming an IPS cell into a hepatocyte-like cells. And they call this IHEP cells with reprogramming of the liver transcription gene. And they also showed that they were able to get progenitor uh, daughter cells, which are fairly hepatocytic in function. Um, I have worked on the fetal liver cell to try to understand the differentiation process as well as the uh, liver embryogenesis. And we have shown that, interestingly, there is a, a dual stage hepatocyte uh, embryolog embryolog embryogenic development, where at 22 weeks, there is a sudden expansion of the EPCAM positive progenitor cells, which uh, are the precursors of hepatocytes. And we were isolating cells uh, from this uh, particular time point to try to expand them in vitro. In fact, there's an interesting story whereby the fetal liver uh, initially acts as an organ of uh, hematopoiesis, but about 22 weeks, there's a sudden mesenchymal to epithelial transition where the mesenchymal cells convert to epithelial progenitor cells, and that's when the fetal liver is no longer conducive for hematopoiesis, and that's when blood formation moves to the bone marrow instead of the liver. And I'm sure the hematologists will be very familiar uh, with this uh, embryogenic development. The problem with this embryo embryological approach is that although well, progenitor cells are uh, obviously uh, uh, abundant in supply, the daughter cells are at best fetal in nature. Uh, we are not quite able to get them into differentiated hepatocytes. The reproducibility of the protocols is finicky, depending on the source of your progenitor cells, and the cell numbers is still a limitation. So the implication of tissue repair is, is still very uncertain, and this has sort of limited the ability of these cells to be used, pushed into the clinical setting. What about liver stem cells in disease states? So um, over the last 20 years, people have started recognizing that, that during chronic liver injury, there is a ductular proliferation. While the pathologists first thought that this was a, a marker of liver injury, it was found that these ductular cells were actually the progenitor cells that came from the canals of Terry and was trying to attempt to repair the liver by a streaming differentiation hypothesis. So this then put a lot of focus on these progenitor cells, and many groups tried to isolate these cells to expand them in culture. The thinking was that liver injury, somehow the differentiation and the repair process was inhibited, and if you can bypass this signal stop, you are then able to repair the liver. However, this approach was thrown into uh, total chaos and confusion. When using uh, the pre lox tracing, people showed that many of these progenitor cells was not from the de novo progenitor cells that we see in the canals of herring. And in fact, they were actually hepatocytes that was de-differentiating into proliferating cells. Well, there has been a lot of controversies to this, and many groups have shown opposite data. Uh, this has cast the concept of whether there are the novo stem cells in the liver uh, in, into a big uh, question mark. Um, while some may argue that, well, even if the hepatocytes are differentiating, they still can be harnessed to repair the liver. But uh, to date, there is probably no consensus on whether there are de novo progenitor cells in the adult liver after uh, the, the, the neonatal stage of liver formation. The bone marrow has uh, been, been classically a, a source that people have looked at. 
uh, firstly, arising from the fact that uh, people think that the bone marrow cells are highly plastic, they can differentiate it with the hepatocyte. And secondly, also from a clinical setting, uh, learning, learning from the, the hematologist's experience, this was one cell source that was available, autologous in availability, and therefore could be tested to see whether they would help the liver. And to date, uh, after many experiments, people have shown that the bone marrow stem cell does not quite contribute significantly to regeneration of the hepatocyte. In a very, very early study in 1990, the excitement was first cast when people showed that uh, in bone marrow uh, sex mismatch transplantation, you are able to see uh, liver cells that came from the bone marrow that was the female uh, uh, chromosome, and therefore suggesting that there was a direct transdifferentiation route. However, this has been shown to be uh, more uh, very rare uh, sort of a signature, and most of the time you hardly get any difference on uh, hepatocytes from the bone marrow stem cells. And so uh, all the other sources, such as the peripheral blood stem cells, umbilical cord, adipose tissue, uh, have all tried to use the same concept, but uh, differentiation is generally thought to be very, very low this day, and it's not a practical solution for liver regeneration. So bone marrow stem cells do not transdifferentiate to hepatocytes. So where do we go from that with all these uh, uh, disappointing approaches that has not uh, born into fruition? So I'll run through some uh, clinical approaches and clinical concepts by which we are hoping to repair the liver with cell therapy. And, and there are probably three scenarios that uh, would benefit from this approach. The first is uh, pediatric patients with inborn errors of metabolism. So usually these genetic defects uh, suffer from uh, uh, insufficiency. And in fact, replacing 5% of the hepatocytes would be considered sufficient to give the uh, genetic metabolic uh, supplement that's needed to try to reverse the phenotype. And, and so therefore, uh, this is something that, that is thought to be useful. In acute liver failure, uh, the liver literally burns up. It goes into uh, severe, uh, necrosis, apoptosis, and you are suffering from a, a situation where there is hypo function of the liver, uh, insufficient liver function. And therefore, taught us that if you can replace enough hepatocyte function to the liver, that would help. In liver cirrhosis, it is a lot more complicated. The liver is hardened, the architecture is different, and therefore this causes significant problems uh, when you try to put cells in. So in liver cirrhosis, the portal hypertension presents a challenge. The flow in the portal vein is reversed. So when injecting cells through the portal vein, your cells literally flow out of it. Secondly, due to the extracellular matrix in the liver cirrhosis, uh, there is uh, no space for cells to engraft. And very, I can like the bone marrow transplant where you clear the bone marrow space for your hepatopoietic cells to go in, you actually don't have uh, any space for your cells when you put it through the, circular, uh, the circulatory system. In the liver cirrhosis, there's risk of sepsis and cancer. In acute liver failure, uh, if you look downwards, the situation is a little bit different whereby there is a fire that's literally burning in the liver. So any attempts to put cells there, uh, the cells will be killed because it's a hostile environment. There's also no scaffold for the cells to grow. So as a result, uh, it is difficult to uh, meaningfully implant cells to cause regeneration. And of course, patients are at risk of sepsis and encephalopathy. And so many patients perish uh, in the, th the terminal stage of disease, even though we are trying to replace the liver function. But in, in terms of uh, trials and therapy, many groups have actually tried this in the pediatric population uh, using hepatocyte transplantation. So not necessarily stem cells, but just uh, hepatocytes that have been isolated from uh, donor grafts to try to see whether we can correct the inborn errors of metabolism. And you can see probably the most famous paper was published in the Fingernagel syndrome, the first uh, trial that was listed uh, by Fox. This was what people call the N equals to one NEGN paper, where he described the experience of hepatocyte transplantation in the child with Fingernagel. And there was a reduction of 30 to 50% in the bilirubin without need for phototherapy. So while Hill as a principle of proof uh, the, the authors felt that it was a failure because, number one, uh, the patient, the, this effect was not sustained. The patient could not stay off phototherapy. And secondly, the cells were lost after six months. And that uh, is probably due to rejection and the turnover of cells and therefore uh, limiting the ability of a sustained, persistent replacement of the genetic abnormality. But you can see that uh, there have been many metabolic diseases that, that people have tried cell transplant with some benefit in terms of measurable metabolic effect. But overall, the results have not been exciting. And so this effort continues uh, in many of the pediatric units to try to save, uh, salvage many of these pediatric patients. So in acute liver failure, we mentioned that uh, you have an environment that is uh, not ideal to put cells in. So people have tried to see whether you can put it outside the liver or even outside the human body. And thus, whether we can use these cells in bioreactors 
uh, away from the toxic environment of the failing liver, but you can dialyze the patient and replace the liver function. So it's, instead of hepatocytes uh, as well as stem cells, people have looked at uh, transformed cells to provide a limitless source of supply. And you can see there are many machines that are available, the ELAT, the MELS, hepatocyst, which uses different cell types uh, in attempt to dialyze the liver. But unfortunately, uh, systematic reviews over the last 20 years have also shown a lack of survival efficacy. And in fact, there's uh, very little survival benefit uh, when patients are so sick in acute liver failure that just replacing the liver function is not quite enough to reverse the, the sepsis, the uh, liver encephalopathy, and the, uh, the very morbid situation at that point in time. So they are not quite useful. Okay. Then the third scenario is where we have seen the most uh, work done, and that is in patients with liver cirrhosis. So these are patients who would uh, somehow not fulfill criteria for liver transplantation, but need a liver, otherwise uh, they would run into trouble. Uh, you can see there's a whole list of trials that have been reported, primarily from uh, autologous uh, bone marrow stem cells, and there have been many variants. Some take it from the bone marrow mononuclear cells, some filter, takes out only the hepatopoietic stem cells, and some have gone into the umbilical cord. So various uh, hematopoietic stem cells of sorts uh, that people have tried and to put transplant it into patients. And again, the mode of transplantation has been variable. Uh, some use a single injection, some goes by the hepatic vein, some uses hepatic artery, and some uses the portal vein. So no standardized uh, uh, method or approach, but different things have been tried. In small studies, uh, there seems to be an effect, uh, even in a few randomized control study up to 50 to 100 patients, they have claimed that there is some benefit in terms of the overall liver function improvement after these stem cells have been transplanted. But the question that, that, that arises is, if we have shown in very few of these cells transdifferentiated in hepatocyte, how, why are we seeing an improvement in function? And that's where many of you will be familiar, whereby people have looked at the effect of many of these uh, hematopoietic source of cells that they think that the effect is not due to direct function, but it's, come, it's really from the non-parenchymal effect, the growth factors, the exosomes, the anti-inflammatory effect, and antifibrotic effect that is potentially helping the patient. And thus, uh, one may argue that if that is so, then you really need to give, uh, you just need to give the uh, exosomes or, or the extract from these cells without having to put the cells in because the cells are not really doing a direct repair, uh, but it's more of giving the, the secretory function to the liver. Um, so, look, using meta-analysis, which is supposed to be the highest evidence of uh, efficacy, uh, they have looked at all these studies and showed that actually, if you pull them together, there is potential benefit and the overall mortality actually uh, is in favor of uh, bone marrow stem cells. Uh, look, using uh, multivariate analysis, they showed that single injection was more effective than multiple injections, which is a little bit uh, counterintuitive. They showed that hepatic arterial infusion was more effective than intravenous infusion. And... Uh, bone marrow cells were more effective than those derived from the umbilical cord. So not a lot known in terms of biology, but this is what the data tells us in terms of uh, meta-analysis, that potentially uh, these cells may have an effect. However, despite the, the strength of the meta-analysis, uh, most people believe that the, the concept is still flawed. And this comes mainly because from this one study that was done in UK, um, a lot of the earlier studies was done in, not in the first world countries. And so therefore, uh, whether it's due to bias or concerns of the way the study was done, uh, people were actually looking for a well-conducted multi-center randomized controlled study, uh, which was done uh, in, in 2017 uh, in UK, where they used CD133 positive stem cells uh, autologously from the peripheral blood. So they, uh, not a huge number of patients, well, almost 75 patients in total, uh, they compared them in standard care, giving just GCSF, and GCSF followed by uh, leukophoresis, to pull out the CD133 cells, and then using intravenous infusion, uh, they give back these cells in three lots to these patients, and to then look at the outcomes of these patients in terms of clinical uh, uh, uses. So you can see, uh, in this graph here, you can see that there's no clear distinction or separation of these three curves. When you look at the MEL score, um, as well, which is a marker for liver function, looking at composites of bilirubin, albumin, uh, aside, uh, as well as uh, creatinine. And, and GCSF, with or without hematopoietic stem cell, unfortunately did not improve liver function uh, or normal fibrosis. And in fact, they noted there was increased frequency of adverse events compared with standard care. And adverse events they saw 
was found in both groups with just GCSF or those with stem cell infusion. Uh, there was worsening of NEL in some patients, ascites, sepsis, and papillopathy. And there's also theoretical risk of HCC because you're putting a progenitor cell in. So this study has been called the, the study to end all stem cell studies, at least from the bone marrow, uh, because it provides us uh, sort of RCT evidence to show that uh, such an approach with uh, stem cell from a bone marrow does not quite work. Uh, however, there have been uh, some concerns about how this study was done, mainly because uh, if you induce, uh, you, you give GCSF, homing of these cells into the liver and what, the, what, what this therapy actually uh, did for the patients. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the challenges uh, that, 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 that is going in, into such approaches. I think the biggest challenge that we had uh, from looking at cell replacement therapy is a very simplistic view that uh, a small amount of stem cells will be able to regenerate the liver. The liver has 240 billion cells and of uh, which 60% are hepatocytes, 40% are non-parenchymal. So in terms of the cell therapy that we're doing, when we put about 5% of cells in, we're talking about you needing 5 billion cells in a pail, literally, not in a petri dish, um, to try to repair the liver. Otherwise, uh, it will have very minimal impact in terms of the overall liver function. And there have been novel approaches to this. Uh, one group from uh, US uh, uh, had looked at trying to farm hepatocytes and they extended this concept from the FAH minus minus mice, which is a mice with extreme selection pressure, where the liver goes in the process in, in, where in the cells have been knocked out of this FAH. And therefore, if you transplant human hepatocytes in and using this type of high selection pressure, they were able to repopulate the mouse liver to up to 90% of human hepatocytes. And so they were trying to replicate this in large pig models uh, using in vivo farming to try to harvest human hepatocytes and therefore uh, catch large numbers of these hepatocytes for transplantation and for drug testing. So this effort has been on for about five years now. Uh, the people are sort of waiting for sort of definitive evidence that uh, this is a good sustainable source of cells for therapeutics as well as for testing. What about the delivery of cells? So I mentioned the liver has uh, two blood circulation. You can give it to intra-artery, the intravenous, and intravenous has both the portal circulation and the normal venous circulation. The normal liver receives about 70% of the blood flow from intraportal circulation. So actually that is a good source of a good way of delivering cells. However, the engraftment efficiency in all the studies has been extremely low. And in one of the modeling experiments, which we did on mice, uh, we, gave, uh, you know, uh, we gave cells that were marked with CFDSE dye and observed these cells uh, as they go through the system and looking at whether they were uh, moving into the hepatic sinusoids. And in fact, we found that many of these cells were stuck into the, in the portal uh, circulatory system in, in the small uh, tribu tribu uh, tribulations. And if it actually worsens ischemia and worsening of liver function due to the obstruction uh, rather than helping the liver. And this is perhaps why arterial thrombosis, uh, sorry, arterial approach may be a little bit better. However, there have also been clinical cases whereby arterial thrombosis has happened uh, with uh, disastrous outcomes uh, if a patient literally dies from the cell transplant itself. So the jury is still out there in terms of what is the best way to deliver cells. Otherwise, if you shoot in cells through the vascular system and the cells do not go out into the uh, sinusoid space, uh, the cells literally pass through the liver and there is very little homing uh, repair effect on the liver. The third problem we have to overcome, as I mentioned earlier, is how to create space uh, in the liver uh, for these cells to enter. Again, in our tracking experiments that we showed, um, we only less than 1% of the cells actually traverse the sinusoidal endothelial space into the hepatic cords. In liver cirrhosis, the liver is, is, has a lot of extracellular matrix. The sinusoidal endothelial cells are actually closed. There's no fenestra, and there's very little chance for these cells to go out into the liver cords. So borrowing from the hemato uh, hematologist's experience whereby in a, traditionally in bone marrow transplant, they were irradiating the bone marrow and giving chemotherapy to kill the hematopoietic stem cells so that new cells can actually go into colonize the liver. People have tried experimentations with radiation to the liver or ischemic reperfusion conditioning, which this experiment here, which we did in our own lab, uh, we use uh, ischemia reperfusion to try to open up the endothelial space uh, during ischemia reperfusion, uh, the biggest stress is on endothelial cells, and that's where after uh, IRI, the endothelial cells actually goes to apoptosis, shrinks, open up gaps 
within the liver cells. And you could see that the perfusion uh, percentage actually increases after IRI compared to no IRI where there is less than 1% of perfusion. Translating to a clinical setting, this has been difficult. Uh, while some people uh, argue that you could give some radiation to the liver, uh, most clinicians would be, would be hesitant to do this because in liver cirrhosis, you are dealing with a uh, 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 literally patient on a cliff and any further injury to the liver and whereby your cell transplantation is not successful, you would literally push the patient uh, over the cliff and end up with a mortality. And so from a clinical translation point of view, it has been very difficult to test this out in terms of creating space in the liver for your cell therapy to work. So where are we heading uh, next? So with single cell um, approaches, we have started to realize that the liver is more complex than we thought. Uh, while we simplistically think that there are 60% hepatocyte and 40% non parenchymal cells, uh, with single cell analysis, we have shown that there are more than 20 discrete cell populations within the liver, hepatocytes, endothelial cells, you name it, cholangiocytes, and the whole array of immune cell, T cells, NK monocytes that we are just starting to understand in terms of what it does uh, in terms of normal physiological function and what happens in disease state uh, when extracellular matrix are deposited in cirrhosis. And all these cells play an important role in creating the microenvironment for normal homeostasis and or dysregulation during homeostasis, which result in cirrhosis. And in terms of conceptual approach, we started to realize that what we have been doing uh, in trying to repair a broken house is literally throwing bricks at it. Uh, many of these bricks will not end up in the holes, the holes on the wall, and it is not surprising why uh, we do not see the, the house becoming stronger or repairing itself. And in fact, throwing bricks at a broken house will just cause further injury to the house, and you can imagine why uh, the process has not been as smooth as we thought. The second approach people then came up with, if you can douse the liver using your understanding of how many of these non-parenchymal cells work, i.e. changing the homeostatic state within the liver so that you allow, you retard fibrosis and in fact trigger fibrinolysis, you will then be able to reverse the fibrosis in the liver and allow the native inherent liver cells to regenerate. And in fact, this has been a push now uh, in some uh, groups to try to use non-parenchymal cells to see whether we can repair the damaged liver. The third approach on the right is really trying to repair the functional unit of the liver. Knowing now that the liver works in a, a structural unit that is important, that's important for the microenvironment, could we not repair the microenvironment and give the liver or the house the best chance to repair itself? And I'll talk a little bit about the, all the three approaches. So this is looking at using non-parenchymal cells to try to repair the liver. So Stuart Forbes will probably uh, is driving uh, many of the uh, uh, novel therapy approaches to liver fibrosis, has launched a study to use a C, uh, monocyte um, to try to you know, autologous repair to replace the macrophage uh, in the liver. The belief is that the macrophages uh, are undergoing the, the M1 to M2 phenotype switch. And in fact, if you are able to put in monocytes that are able to reverse fibrosis and cause fibrinolysis, you theoretically would help to reverse uh, this effect. And therefore, CT14 monocyte isolation uh, has been isolated from the peripheral circulation and are being transfused back into the peripheral veins hoping that it will home deliver and induce fibrinolysis. Uh, this study is expected to complete by this year, and we all expect, uh, are waiting for the results to see if this approach would make a significant clinical difference to the patients with cirrhosis. In, in moving to the repair of the functional unit, I mentioned a little bit about the sinusoidal endothelial cells, which is now becoming the, uh, the, the one barrier to our stem cell approach to repair the liver. And if you look at the liver anatomy, uh, it is divided into 15,000 liver lobules, each of which have its own central vein, hepatic triad, and the hepatic uh, sinusoids are the areas whereby cells actually traverse into the liver cords. It is believed that during liver cirrhosis, the sinusoidal endothelial cells are one of the very first cells to sustain liver injury. And what happens is that the micro uh, pores that you see in the endothelial cells actually closes due to deposition of extracellular matrix. This then results in ischemia within the liver that uh, causes further liver injury and cirrhosis to set in. And therefore, if we were to hit at the very basis of liver cirrhosis, is to try to open up the pores again for oxygen, blood flow, and all the nutrients to flow the liver cells so that it has a chance to repair itself. And uh, one of my, my PhD students, uh, Jamie, who's probably in the audience here, did this experiment way back in 2015 during a PhD where we used a cell type, which um, 
was fairly close to the endothelial cell and we were able to, to, to convert it into epithelial cell as well as uh, hepatocyte function and to look at its effect on the mouse model of liver cirrhosis. And if you follow uh, me from left to right, uh, we transplanted these cells. So de novo from amniotic epithelial cell. The de novo amniotic epithelial cell resembles many of the endothelial cell function. We can differentiate it into epithelial-like function, or we can further differentiate it into a hepatocyte-like function. And using this three cells type, we looked at the effect on the cirrhotic animal model. So on the left side, looking at bilirubin, you will see that in terms of function, the uh, adult hepatocytes was obviously the most effective in bringing down bilirubin because they are the most differentiated. Uh, those that were hepatocyte differentiated, which is the HD, had more effect, whereas the uh, de novo and epithelial, because they don't have such good liver function, have a minimal activity on bilirubin. On prothrombin, interestingly, uh, all these cell types were quite capable of producing clotting factors and able to reverse the coagulopathy. And if you look at fibrosis, interestingly, uh, it is the de novo cells and the epithelial cells that has the greatest effect in terms of reversing liver fibrosis. Interestingly, adult hepatocytes do not reverse liver fibrosis. And again, that's quite well expected because when you put hepatocyte, you're hoping it to perform liver function uh, without this liver repair function. So this gives us the first clue that perhaps we um, are probably a little bit too uh, naive in thinking that giving hepatocytes, we will repair the cirrhotic liver, but actually what we need to do is to repair the structure of the liver at least provide a scaffold to see whether you can get better function. And so we went back further to look at some of our fetal uh, liver experiments, and we showed that actually if you put in uh, the biggest effect on cirrhosis that you see from morphological studies here, so this is a mouse liver that has been induced to have cirrhosis, and in fact it was the non-parenchymal progenitor cells that had the biggest effect on fibrosis reversal rather than the hepatocyte itself. And Using tracing experiment, we look back at some of the early uh, transplantation that we did animals, and we showed that the mouse that showed the biggest effect in fibrosis reversal was when we see a high number of endothelial uh, transplantation and integration into the sinusoids. So the green cells that you see marked on the lower column are actually tracked in the cytohybridization. They came from a human cell source, and they have been integrated into the endothelial sinusoids to repair the liver, and these animals actually showed the biggest effect in terms of fibrosis reversal. So based on that, we started uh, on an uh, early phase uh, one clinical trial, a phase one, one, two, two clinical trial to prove evidence, uh, evidence of proof that the endothelial progenitor cell might be able to repair the liver in terms of fibrosis reversal. And so we use CD133 uh, as a marker of endothelial progenitor cell. And at the point, uh, there has been a lot of uh, controversy as to what is the progenitor of the sinusoidal endothelial cell. And CD133 was one of the readily ones that are easily available in terms of uh, uh, reagents that we could pull out. So the aim was to see whether we could repair the sinusoidal endothelium, stabilize the reverse fibrosis, and improve liver function. The trial was fairly complicated. Uh, we had to pull out a bone marrow from the uh, a, a bone marrow harvesting, thus requiring general, general anesthesia. Uh, this differs from the study I mentioned earlier because we were not sure that the endothelial progenitors were induced by GCSF and was flowing to the peripheral blood, and thus therefore we needed to go to the bone marrow to take the original uh, cells that may be put the endothelial progenitors. However, in many of our patients with liver cirrhosis, they were very sick, and any general anesthesia would actually again tip them over the curve, making it a very difficult trial to, to perform. Uh, these bone marrow cells were then selected uh, with a CD133 Clinimax, and I uh, thank Deep Kun, uh, who has been fantastic uh, co-PI in helping us with this. And um, uh, with our radiology experts, they were able to put a catheter into the portal space and direct these cells directly into the liver. Uh, CAM was, was the key uh, radiologist to help us do this. And by diverting the cells into the right lobe, we wanted to use the left lobe as a control to see whether there's an effect in direct transplantation uh, versus the left lobe, which did not receive any of the cells. And um, we wanted to do a definitive proof that the cells was, happy, was helping. So we did liver biopsies both day zero and day 90 days. And this is perhaps one of the very few trials that had serial liver biopsies to compare the difference between uh, the two the livers. Most studies, as you saw earlier, was just by clinical description to see whether they improve or not and use MRI in between to assess the liver. Uh, I mentioned that it was a very difficult study uh, because uh, liver cirrhosis patients uh, with decompensation are, are very, very fragile. Uh, many of our patients, even when they are put into this study, develop cancer, uh, would die of unrelated causes, uh, making our randomization extremely difficult. And 
even those who received therapy uh, was developing complications that was uncommon. One patient developed hepatitis from GCSF, which then uh, disrupted our plan to put in to go ahead with the transplantation because we were dealing with a flare of the liver just by GCSF alone. And, and there were patients who developed encephalopathy, hepatorenal syndrome while going through the study. And I must say that uh, it was quite a harrowing experience every time we put a patient on the protocol. So the, these are the results, the preliminary results from this very small group of study. And while we could not do intention to treat because of the, uh, the I mentioned the complexity, we tried to look at patients who had received cells versus those who had not received cells. So this is looking at albumin, bilirubin. Uh, so the, the columns are zero to 90 days, 180 days and 360. But the biggest effect one would imagine would be zero to 90 days because that's when the cells have gone in and we are tracking longer term to a year just to make sure that uh, what happened to look at the sustainability of this effect. Uh, the numbers are very small. The p-values are not significant, but seems to favor a transplantation p-value of 0.1 on these very small numbers. But I have to admit that uh, statistically, uh, we have not seen improvement in male score uh, for these small numbers, but that appears to be uh, at least a directional effect for people who receive the cell versus those who don't. In terms of the AS, sorry, AST, ALT, um, uh, again, numerically, we saw some improvement in the AST and ALT. Uh, this was a bit unexpected because we were expecting to repair the structure of the liver and not so much for liver function or liver injury. Portal pressure, we do not, could not detect any differences um, in our cell transplanted population versus control. But uh, possibly what, what may be a, a little bit of uh, encouraging lead, even though we have not going to show significance, is that in two out of three of these patients who received this stem cell therapy, the pathologists were blinded and reported signs of fibrinolysis uh, with narrower fibrous brands and, and evidence of the fibrous brands breaking up in two of these patients. And uh, e sharp fibrosis score, which is the pathologist score, uh, again, not, of, uh, not statistically significant, but in the right direction of favoring uh, cell therapy versus non-cell therapy. So we, we, there's still a lot of work for us to do in terms of looking at uh, other measures of fibrosis. Uh, we know MRE is not good here because MRE takes the whole, the whole liver when it says fibrosis, but we're hoping to look at analysis of right lobe versus the left lobe, and then go into some of the molecular analysis to see whether these cells have made an effect, can have some effect in these patients. So uh, uh, we're still hoping to follow up many of these uh, results, but um, while, while it has been a difficult study, uh, probably uh, demonstrating the in terms of feasibility and the complexity of being able to carry, scale this up to subsequent population, it has taught us a lot of uh, important lessons. Uh, it has also given us some exciting leads in terms of following up. But in summary today, um, while stem cells provide exciting potential therapy for patients, uh, especially for those with liver cirrhosis um, and those who don't qualify for transplant, but uh, efficacy has remained elusive. The bottleneck remains in having an optimal source of clinically useful cells that can be delivered into the liver and as such, uh, clinicians have sort of uh, borrowed from hematopoietic stem cells and various stem cells options to try to help the liver. The ideal strategy uh, still uh, at this preliminary stage, we will need to combine efforts at trying to replace the liver function as well as reverse cirrhotic microenvironment to allow the liver to trigger a pro-regenerative response to improve outcomes. But there are many interesting advances and promising ones in the uh, coming up uh, using uh, gene editing, nanotechnology. Uh, we are hoping to be able to uh, more granular detail, control the cell cell interactions to try to reverse the toxic environment within the liver to give our cells a better chance to succeed. So, with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Dan, for a very detailed and elaborate presentation on your work. We will now proceed with the QA session. So, the first question is What is your take on 3D cell printing since stem cell therapy is not showing promising results? Thanks, uh, Christopher. So 3D cell printing uh, is, uh, is a new area that has come up. Uh, I think the biggest advantage of 3D cell printing allows us to now create the liver lobule, as I mentioned, to study the liver function and interaction within the different units. In terms of uh, therapy, uh, we still have a problem where, whereby, uh, where we, if you imagine we have difficulty putting a single cell in, uh, we are now having to put an organoid into the system. So that creates a bit of limitation. Uh, previous efforts have tried to put uh, cell clumps uh, into the subcapsular space, hoping that the function uh, from these cells will repair it. There is one group that put these uh, organoid structures, uh, 3D cell structures, into the lymphoid tissue and hoping to cause hepatization of the lymph nodes uh, to replace the liver function. But as I mentioned, in a cirrhotic liver, 
Uh, we're not just dealing with uh, liver insufficiency, we're also dealing with portal hypertension, we're dealing with all the clinical effects of a cirrhotic liver. So as to the impact of this such an approach in terms of improving overall outcomes uh, would, would still be something that we need to work through to, to have a more multi-pronged or complex approach. Okay. Thank you, Then um, The second question is, may I know what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria for this clinical trial? Thanks. Yeah. So we're happy to share with you the details of this, but just to point out that um, the, the complexity of the trial also uh, resulted in us shifting the inclusion and exclusion criteria. When we first put up for this study, the intent was to try to salvage patients for uh, decompensated liver cirrhosis. And that's because being a novel therapy, we really wanted to do no harm. But in patients who are decompensated, who really have uh, uh, very bad uh, uh, prognosis, uh, this is something that would help to salvage them. Uh, in the review process, we discussed and we realized that if patient is decompensated, it will be very difficult to show a benefit. In fact, it was the reviewers who told us to try to shift the approach to less sick patients to try to see whether we could provide a principle of proof. Uh, so that became a bit of a challenge because if patients are still well, why are we doing this novel therapy? But if patients are very sick, they are too far down the line, it is going to be difficult to show a benefit. So we, in the end, we, we settled on patients who have uh, at least some degree of decompensation, who do not qualify for liver uh, transplantation because that would still be the gold standard. And at least uh, we have uh, exclusion of all the other risk factors, infection and so on uh, that are in this study. So these were decompensated patients. Along the way, uh, we do, did indeed ran, run into a lot of trouble with patients who are decompensated. In fact, the first few patients who, who were decompensated, who were literally uh, hoping for this lease of life they put on, uh, had, had quite a lot of challenges. They had encephalopathy, they went with better renal syndrome. One of them needed a transplantation. And that's when we adjusted the inclusion criteria to include uh, patients who were not decompensated, but at least had liver cirrhosis. So the base was that you must have liver cirrhosis and, and at least abnormal liver function in one parameter before we take you on. Uh, the biggest limitation was liver cancer. Cirrhosis patients do develop liver cancer even while waiting for the study um, or even when they completed the study, cancers are popping up all over the place and we lost quite a lot of patients uh, through, through liver cancer. So those were some of the challenges uh, with regards to the, uh, indicate, uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, but we'd be happy to share with you the details uh, in terms of the specifics. Thank you, Prof. Then at this point of time, we don't have any further questions. So to our audience, if you have any more questions, please feel free to post your question in the Q&A function and Prof. Then will be glad to answer your question. Any more questions, anyone? Since we don't have any more questions, Prof. Dan, would you like to um, share something to wrap up your presentation? Okay, so I think this uh, study has um, taught us uh, uh, two things. One, of course, with the revelation that the liver is much more complex than we thought. Um, the, 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 the move is now away from just a simplistic approach of putting one cell type to repair the liver. And uh, people are now focusing on trying to uh, create the whole microenvironment in, in the cirrhotic liver. So I think what we will probably see moving ahead is uh, more than one cell candidate being put in as cell therapy, hopefully to get a synergistic effect from it. The uh, efforts on the um, exosomes and the secretory functions of some of the recent chymo stem cells has been continuing. And in fact, if that comes true, then technically we don't even need to put cells in anymore. We just have to infuse in the, the secretome, secretome and get the liver to repair itself. But I think a lot still needs to be unraveled in terms of what are the key secretomes that helps in reversing liver fibrosis. Um, so, so I think we've come a long way around uh, in terms of cell therapy approaches. Uh, and um, the, the biggest challenge would be uh, finding way, a method, a way whereby we can break up, crack open the sinusoidal endothelial cells to put ourselves in there. And, and that's something that several groups are approaching at this point in time. So I, I, I think um, we are almost literally uh, 20, 30 years behind bone marrow transplantation. 
if, if, if I uh, chance to read some of the earlier stories of bone marrow transplantation, when people were screaming it was murder, it was poorly conceived, it was damaged, it was killing off the original hematopoly stem cell. Uh, we are actually at that stage to try to address some of these very tricky questions uh, and to see how we can break through on the approaches for, for cell uh, integration and graft into the liver. Thanks. Thank you so much, Prof Dan, for your time and for today's lecture. Um, so since we do not have any more questions, uh, we have now come to the end of our lecture. On behalf of Actress, we would like to thank every one of you, um, Prof Dan and our audience for your time today. And we hope to see you all again in our next lecture on the 29th of July. So once again, thank you, Prof Dan. Thank you, everyone. And have a good day. Thank you.